It's really a pleasure today uh, to welcome a fellow chemical engineer, although he's now defining himself as a biochemical engineer, which is okay, uh, Jay Kisling from uh, Cal Berkeley. So uh, Jay and I have known each other for a very, very long time, and he's been doing some outstanding things. Uh, in particular, he is now the Howe Professor uh, of Biochemical Engineering at Berkeley. He's uh, the CEO of the Joint Bioenergy Institute. He's also an associate director of the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, he's been involved not only in redefining, or in fact defining what synthetic biology is, uh, but also in starting a number of companies. So he's got an entrepreneurial bent. One of them is Emiris, and we've heard from Carol earlier today about the Gates Foundation uh, giving its first big 42 million grant for the development, for the development of Artemisian, and that was Jay's company that is now doing that. You know, doing a number of small molecule. He's also uh, helped create LS9, which is a biofuel company. And uh, in the past uh, eight years or so, he has been focusing on uh, the development of biofuels from uh, cellulosic material and on engineering a variety of organism and higher organisms to actually uh, do that. And today we'll hear about his talk on advanced plants, I'm sorry, advanced fuel from advanced plants. So Jay, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Are these really dark? Okay, good enough, <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, first I just want to uh, state my conflict of interest. Uh, as Francois already said, I founded a few companies in this space. I'm from a farm in Nebraska where uh, we grew corn uh, that ended up in uh, some not so advanced biofuels, uh, ethanol, and uh, I run a couple of institutes that work in this space. Uh, so I don't have to tell you that almost all of our fuel and chemicals come from petroleum, and that petroleum, when it's pumped up through the ground, is refined um, into the various molecules that we now use on a day-to-day -day basis. And for a variety of reasons, including uh, global warming um, and the need to create our own fuels, we'd like to replace petroleum as a feedstock with other types of renewable materials, uh, specifically sugar, sugars that might come from sugarcane, uh, from starch in plants and uh, from cellulosic biomass. Now, those materials would flow into a refinery, in this case, a biorefinery, that would transform them into a fuel. Uh, in the case right now, we're mainly talking about ethanol throughout the world, but uh, we'd like to replace that, and I'll talk about that with you. When you burn those fuels, you create carbon dioxide, but because that uh, carbon dioxide is reused, to create the plant, um, you have the possibility of having carbon neutral fuels. Now, the US has been focused almost exclusively on using corn as a feedstock uh, for uh, fuels. And there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Starch is a very convenient source of sugar. It's concentrated in the ear of corn, and it's very easy to break down into the component sugars and transform into fuels. But it has a number of challenges. Um, First, water requirements. A huge amount of water is used for corn, and in those places that don't use water for corn, there's no corn this year um, because of the droughts in the U.S. Midwest. Fertilizer is extensive. In fact, uh, one-third of the energy used in agriculture today is used for producing nitrogen-based fertilizers for corn. One percent of the world's energy goes into these nitrogen-based fertilizers, so huge energy sink. And of course, it's a feed for cattle and chickens, and their feed for us. So there are a number of challenges around using corn. Um, probably the most important issue, though, is the low energy yield you get when you produce a fuel from corn. So if you just look at energy out in terms of the fuel versus energy in in producing the corn, you get, best case scenario, about 34% more energy out than you put in. In some other scenarios, they actually say that you get less energy out than you put in. So in any case, it's very nearly neutral in terms of energy out versus energy in. And compare that now to sugarcane 
grown in Brazil, almost eight times the energy out as put in. Um, and that's a huge difference. Now, we can't grow sugarcane except for the very deep south in the US and in Hawaii. And so we're probably not going to be using a lot of sugarcane uh, for fuels in the US. Um, we could use switchgrass. And switchgrass, if you notice, um, has a significant, significantly better yield than corn, less than sugarcane, but not bad, about four times the energy out versus that that goes into it. Now, uh, the US Department of Energy and US Department of Agriculture, uh, when they were doing an assessment of what they thought we could produce in terms of cellulosic biomass, um, they looked over several decades. And uh, starting out right now, if we just collect the fallen trees in the forest, if we collect some of the uh, agriculture residues we think we can get access to, if we take municipal waste, we get up to about 500 million dry tons of biomass. But going out to uh, a decade or two later, we might be able to get up to 1.3, 1.5 billion tons of biomass on an annual basis that we could devote to producing energy. Now, if you wanted to just compare how much energy you might get out from that 1.3 billion tons of biomass, let's compare it to the 2010 uh, use of oil in the US. So the US used about 7 billion barrels of oil equivalent um, in 2010. Roughly half of that was imported and half was domestically produced. If you take that 1.3 billion tons of biomass and you burn it, the energy out is roughly equivalent to the energy either in the imported or the domestically produced oil for 2010. And um, if you turn that into a fuel using technologies we anticipate having, we could get to about a the third, one third of the fuel used in 2010. That would be a huge difference in terms of worldwide economics, in terms of worldwide uh, politics, and in terms of the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere. But there's a lot between what we've got now and what we'd hope to get to. And that's really why we have institutes like JBay. Now, there's another important reason to look at cellulosic biomass, and that came out of a study done at the University of Nebraska in 2008. They cultivated switchgrass over several years uh, on several farms in Nebraska and Iowa and harvested it and turned it into ethanol. And they found something really interesting, and that is that they said not only could you do carbon neutral fuels, you might even be better, to, you might even get better than carbon neutral. So you might actually sequester more carbon dioxide than you actually use in the production process and in burning the fuel. And the reason is because these are perennials. Corn is an annual, and so every year we're replanting it. But with perennials, you have the possibility of the roots getting established, microbes growing around it, and those microbes actually sequester a lot of carbon in the soil. And so you've got a, a much more carbon in the soil. So you can see here that uh, wherever it's above this red line, that's actually um, carbon negative. We're actually sequestering more carbon than we're putting into the atmosphere. So it's a great possibility. Now, let's just talk about that biomass as a feedstock because it's pretty complicated. This is what a typical plant looks like after the plant cells have died. This is where the plant cells are, and these are the secondary cell walls that are left. And they're pretty complicated. So they're made of primarily three components. Uh, two of those components are sugar-based. So hemicellulose is made of five carbon sugars, and cellulose is made of six carbon sugars. And then we've got this aromatic polymer called lignin uh, that wraps everything. And lignin gives the plant rigidity. Um, it also uh, protects the sugars in the cellulose and hemicellulose. The challenge is that we'd really like to have as much cellulose and hemicellulose as possible and as little lignin, but we can't get rid of all of it, unfortunately. Now, if we just look at the typical plant, it's roughly two-thirds sugars. That's pretty amazing, two-thirds sugars. The rest is, is protein, ash, and lignin. Um, so we'd like to get access to those roughly two-thirds uh, sugars that are in uh, any number of different plants. Now, in order to get access to that, we take the biomass and we run it through a pretreatment process. And this pretreatment process has as its goal to remove as much lignin as possible and give you as clean a cellulose and hemicellulose as possible. Then we use enzymes to break down those polymers into sugars. Now, unlike the polymers uh, of, of um, starch uh, that we find in corn, where you need essentially one cheap enzyme to break it down into sugars, in cellulose and hemicellulose, 
the polymers are really complicated. Now, just to give you an idea of how complicated those polymers are, this shirt is 100% cotton, and that means that it's essentially 100% glucose. And yet, I throw this in the laundry, or somebody throws it in the laundry for me, and they wash it, and it comes out every time. It doesn't dissolve, right? So that tells you how good that polymer is, that sugar polymer, and how strong it is. Now, it takes pretty significant enzymes to break this polymer down. In fact, your laundry deter detergent has those enzymes in it. That's why I don't have fuzz balls all over my cotton shirt, because there are enzymes in there. But we need a lot of enzymes, and they're expensive enzymes. There's been a study that's shown that it, they add anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar to every gallon of fuel that's made from cellulosic biomass, 50 cents to a dollar. So it's a huge cost. In fact, it might be the single biggest cost besides the biomass itself. And then finally, we've got to turn those sugars into fuels. So there are a number of challenges here. I've alluded to many of these. We'd like biomass that has as much sugar as possible, as much cellulose and hemicellulose and as little lignin as possible. We'd like better pretreatment processes that give really clean cellulose and hemicellulose so that when we add the enzymes to it, um, uh, those enzymes can readily break it down. Sometimes those pretreatment processes generate inhibitors that poison the enzymes that do the depolymerization and the microbes that ferment the sugars into the fuels. And so we'd like as few of these inhibitors as possible. Um, we'd like cheap enzymes and as few enzymes as possible for this uh, last step in the pretreatment process. And we'd like fuels for all types of engines. We'd like fuels not just as oxygenates in gasoline, but diesels and jet fuels, and in particular, jet fuels, because there's no replacement um, for jet fuels. So uh, JBay was created to look at this problem in a holistic nature, to look at how all of these pieces fit together and to find solutions where it's integrated across feedstocks, pretreatment enzymes, and microbes. And I'm going to talk just about a few of those areas today, particularly as they relate to synthetic biology. So just let's address some of these challenges. The first challenge is this challenge with the lignin. The lignin is this tough polymer that wraps the biomass, keeps critters away from the sugars in cellulose and hemicellulose, and it makes it really difficult to break down and extract the sugars from that biomass. So there's two approaches you could take. You could come up with better pretreatment methods, which I won't talk about today. Or you could engineer plants that will release their lignin more readily um, and give you a very clean cellulose and hemicellulose. And I want to talk about that now. So um, this is a, a structure of lignin. Um, it's an artist rendition. It's a really complicated polymer. It's primarily aromatics uh, that have a lot of carbon-carbon and ether bonds. And these are very difficult to break down. There are very few enzymes that will break these down. Lignin in the wild breaks down pretty slowly. Um, there are certain fungi that do it. <clears throat> so there were studies several years ago that showed that you could reduce by a small percentage the amount of lignin in a plant, but you can't get rid of it altogether. And so we reasoned, well, if you can't get rid of it altogether, maybe you could at least make it easier to release from the biomass. Maybe you could add stops in the lignin that wouldn't reduce the total amount of lignin, but would give you shorter lignin and allow you to get it away from the biomass much easier. So uh, if you think about putting stops in lignin, you've got to think about uh, modifying the metabolic pathways that make the precursors, shown right here, to lignin. So Dominique Loki um, and his colleagues at JBay found uh, a very small change you could make in a metabolic pathway in the plant. You'd introduce those enzymes into the plant, and you could shuttle some of those intermediates to intermediates that would essentially make those stops in the lignin. And it had been shown several years ago that you could actually add some of these intermediates to growing plants, and they would get incorporated into the lignin. So you express this enzyme, you get these intermediates made, and then you make shorter lignin. Now the first test is, does the plant grow? Because after all, if the plant doesn't grow, it doesn't really matter if it's got shorter lignin. Um, and, and so in this first case, yes, indeed the plants grow. So these are the uh, varieties of the plants. We, we start everything with Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is not going to be a bioenergy crop, let me just say that. Um, but it's a great plant to do these studies in initially. And you can see that they're growing just about as well as the wild-type plant. Now, do they make shorter lignin? So this is 
uh, uh, chromatograph of the, the lignin coming out, so size exclusion chromatography. So the big stuff comes out first, the little stuff comes out last. You can see here, so in the black is the control, and in the burgundy is the engineered plant, and you can see we've got less of the big stuff and more of the short stuff. But the real proof is, does it release the sugars more readily? And regardless of the pretreatment method, whether it's just a simple hot water, dilute alkaline, or dilute acid, we get anywhere from 30 to 60% increase in the sugars released, and yet we haven't really substantially changed the amount of lignin in that plant, and they grow pretty well. Now, as I said, uh, a few years ago, it was shown that you could actually interrupt the lignin biosynthetic pathways and reduce the amount of lignin in the plant. And um, it's difficult to see, but this is the height of the, the, uh, the mutant plant. Here's the wild type plant up here. Here's the mutant plant right here. Here's the wild type plant. So when you do that, when you try to reduce the amount of lignin, you often end up with these short plants. And this is just an example where they uh, engineered, essentially knocked out this particular enzyme or knocked it down. And they got these very short plants. And if you then take a cross section of the biomass and put it under the microscope, what you see and is that you, these vessels here, you, you might have to take my word for it, um, these vessels are collapsed compared to these. And those vessels are what get the nutrients from uh, the roots up to the leaves and, and the sugars back from the leaves down into the roots. So collapsed vessels aren't a good thing, and that's why you end up with short plants. Um, so what we've gotten then is a reduction in the lignin in the plant. And, and Dominique's team said, well, what if we just specifically deposit the lignin in those vessels? Let's leave it out of the rest of the plant, the fibers, where we really want to get the biomass, but let's reduce the amount, uh, it, keep the amount of lignin the same in uh, the vessels so that the plants will grow upright. Now, how do you do that? How do you selectively keep the lignin in the vessels uh, and not in the fibers? Well, you do that by engineering transcription factors. Transcription factors are what's responsible for putting fingers on hands and toes on feet and not on our heads. Um, and in the plants, they also control the makeup of the plant and where things are deposited in the plant. So you've got to find vessel-specific transcription factors and fiber-specific transcription factors. Use the fiber-specific transcription factors to turn down lignin production in the fibers and to keep the amount of lignin constant in the vessels. So Dominique did that. He found a vessel-specific transcription factor. He uh, engineered a promoter in front of this C4H uh, enzyme. This is the enzyme that we knocked down in those previous plants that were very short. Uh, and here's just uh, a picture of that plant. Um, and so the whole idea is now this enzyme would be expressed in the fibers, in the vessel, sorry, and not in the fibers, and therefore we'd have lignin in the vessels. And so, indeed, in these lignin-engineered plants now, they grow much better than the mutant. They grow almost as well as the wild type. And if you look in here at the vessels, you can see the vessels are not collapsed. The vessels are actually um, pretty much normal compared to the wild type plant. And we get a reduction in the amount of lignans overall, and that's because we've reduced it in the fibers. In this case, uh, we've reduced it by about 30%. And that translates into an increase in the amount of sugars that get released from the plant. Now, if you notice that plant picture I showed you before, it's pretty holy. It's got a lot of holes in it. It's like Swiss cheese. And wouldn't it be nice if we could fill some of those holes up, put more biomass in the plant? After all, why can't we? Why are there so many holes in the plant? So, Dominique and his team decided, well, we ought to be able to use the same idea, engineer the transcription factors to increase the amount of biomass, fill up those, some of those holes. Now, you can't fill them all up, but you can fill up a lot of those holes. So he engineered the transcription factors. Actually, we put a feed-forward loop on these, so the transcription factor is controlling its own expression. So once it gets expressed, it gets overexpressed. That uh, leads to an increase, and you can see here, you can see the, the thickness of these cell walls. They've increased pretty substantially in these plants. But really what you'd like to do is you'd like to stack these traits on top of each other. You'd like to reduce the amount of lignin in the fibers, keep the amount of lignin the same in the vessels, and increase the overall amount of biomass so that you get an increase in the amount of sugars from that biomass. And here are those plants where we've now stacked the traits. So we've got 
the C4H gene under the control of the vessel specific promoter. So we're getting the lignin in the vessels. Um, and if we just now compare these wild type plants to the engineered plants, you can see how thick these cell walls are compared to the wild type plants. So now we filled up these holes. The fibers have less lignin. The vessels have the amount of lignin, and so they're able to grow. And here's this plant now with the stacked gene traits in it. You can see it grows almost as well as the wild type plants. If you look at them here, they're almost indistinguishable, and we get increased sugar out of it, regardless of whether we use a hot water pretreatment, which is a very gentle pretreatment, or we use a dilute alkaline pretreatment, which is more like the industrial standard. And we're getting a pretty substantial increase in the amount of sugars. More sugars out of the plant biomass means cheaper fuels as a result. Now, for the rest of my talk, I want to focus on production of advanced biofuels. So I talked a little bit about uh, engineering the plants, but one of the challenges that my research group in particular has been addressing is how do we come up with biofuels that will work in all of our engines? You know, in the U.S. and Brazil, these are the two countries that produce the most ethanol, and ethanol is used as a fuel because it's what nature gave us. It's all we had at the time. Ethanol works great as an oxygenated gasoline. If you have a typical gasoline automobile, you can use it to about 10 even up to 15% ethanol in there, and there'll be no damage to your engine. If you use higher amounts of ethanol without having a flex fuel car, it'll ruin the seals in the engine, and eventually your engine won't be any good. There are a number of other challenges with ethanol. We can't transport it through traditional pipelines because it picks up water and it corrodes those pipelines, leaches out the, the steel in the pipelines, and so you have to have special pipelines if you're gonna pipe it. And so typically we ship it by rail car or truck. Um, an additional challenge is that it's toxic to the microbes that produce it. So yeast will produce it, but then at about 20% ethanol, that's about the highest level we see industrially, the yeast die um, and they don't produce any more ethanol or at least they stop producing ethanol. And so you've got 80% water in there and the only way to get that 80% water out is to use a lot of energy. You can use membranes or you can use distillation but regardless, it requires a lot of energy to get that ethanol out. Um, I like to say that ethanol is better for drinking than for driving. <laughs> so with that in mind, we need fuels for all of our modes of transportation. And what we've been focusing on is producing fuels um, that will work in particularly diesel and jet engines, but also some gasolines. Now, if you think about, if you want to design a new fuel or you want to produce a fuel for our existing infrastructure, you got to think about things like the engine type, whether it's a spark engine or a compression engine, so gasoline or diesel or jet. Um, the energy content, it's got to have a high energy content, it's got to have good combustion quality so we don't want knocking in the engine when you're driving down the road. can't be cloudy. Um, cloudy things plug up fuel filters and you don't like that to happen at 35,000 feet in the atmosphere. Uh, it's got to have the right volatility, it's got to be stable because we want to transport it, we may want to store it over periods of time. can't smell, people don't like smelly things. Uh, it can't be toxic because I can guarantee it's going to get into the groundwater. Every fuel that we've ever had has been, has leaked from tanks, and so it's going to get into um, the groundwater. And we don't want it miscible with water. This is the challenge with ethanol. And we want something that's affordable. We can't have fuels that are $500 a gallon. So when we took basic metabolism that we find in almost all organisms and we matched it up with these qualities of fuels that we wanted, we came up with uh, a pretty good list of molecules. Um, and they include things uh, that are alcohols, but with longer alkyl groups than ethanol. Um, this molecule is uh, a particular kind of holy grail for my group. It's 224-trimethylpentane, or isooctane, which we use to measure the, iso, uh, the octane number in gasoline. Um, aromatics turn out to be really important because they help seals swell in the engine and, and keep them at the, the right swelling. Um, these long alkyl chains, really important for diesel fuels. Um, that's, in fact, what gives diesel and jet fuel its punch. So it's primarily these long alkyl chains. 
But if you have all alkyl chains and you're in Minnesota or in Sweden or at 35,000 feet in the atmosphere, those will all align up and you'll end up having wax in your tank. Um, so in order to prevent wax formation in the tank, you want to have a few branches in it. But the more branches you have in a diesel and a jet fuel, the less the quality of diesel and jet fuel. Just the opposite with gasoline. You need short chains with lots of branches. And that's why 224 trimethyl pentane is a great molecule for gasoline. So we got these molecules. Let's talk about actually producing them in a microbe. And we're going to start with these long alkyl chains. Um, now, right now, we derive these mainly from oil plants. Uh, things like sunflower um, and uh, other plants produce rapeseed, produce uh, these oils. But these aren't a great source for fuels. Their production is pretty limited. If you take an acre of these, you get a very small amount of diesel fuel as compared to the amount that's possible with using cellulosic biomass. The other challenge with these is when you extract that oil from the plant or you take fats, you've got to do some extra chemistry on it to make it into an ester that you could then use as a diesel or jet fuel. So when we started this project, we said, no, we don't want to have to do any other chemistry. We've, we've got enough control of the biology. We ought to be able to produce exactly the fuel that we want um, without further modification. So uh, we started with the fatty acid biosynthetic pathway. Now, the fatty acid biosynthetic pathway uh, produces lipids in all most organisms. Um, there are some that don't have fatty acid-based lipids. Um, and these pathways tend to be very tightly regulated because fats are expensive molecules to make. So organisms regulate their metabolism. So uh, it was shown a few years ago, you could throw in a, a thioesterase and you could cleave the fatty acid from the fatty acyl ACP complex as it's being synthesized and you can get free fatty acids. Um, we showed that if you add in a fad D and you CoA it, you can get fatty acyl CoA. And if at the same time you introduce a pathway to produce ethanol, you can then, with an uh, acyl transferase, produce fatty acid ethyl esters directly. And as it turns out, the cells actually produce these and then secrete them. So here's E. coli growing here um, under the microscope, and here's the bleb of diesel fuel that actually have, has come out of E. coli, and it floats to the top. Now, not only does this give you a fuel that's directly usable, it also is a great purification process. So you grow the microbes up in a vat of sugar. Um, at the end of the production process, you turn off the impellers. The fuel floats to the top. It's kind of like making vinaigrette. Um, uh, the good stuff floats to the top. Uh, you skim it off, and you put it in your tank. Now, it turns out it's not quite that easy in practice. You have to run it through uh, a large-scale cream separator. So this is a centrifuge. Um, the cream comes off the top, in our case, the fuel, and the bugs come off, the bugs in the water come off the bottom. But it gets you a fuel that's nearly directly usable. Now, there was a challenge when we engineered this pathway, um, and that is that the microbes really didn't like it very well. They did everything they could to rid themselves of the metabolic pathway. And while we could do this at small scale, it made it really challenging to scale this up into a larger scale because the microbes would evolve away from the production state before we could get to high densities of the fuel. So when Fuzong Zhang came to my laboratory, he said, you know, Jay, I think you could use a regulator uh, on your pathway, and, and we ought to be able to use some natural regulators. And one of those regulators is FAD-R. So FAD-R naturally regulates fatty acid biosynthesis in, in microbes and many other organisms. Uh, it'll bind either fatty acyl-CoA or it'll bind free fatty acids. And then it turns on or turns off genes um, that it controls. And so we reasoned that if we took FAD-R promoters and placed them in front of the genes that regulate all these different aspects of the pathway, that we might be able to better regulate the pathway and then that would prevent the cells from losing the pathway um, nearly so rapidly as they do. So the challenge, though, is that all of these had to be balanced. We had to have ethanol production balanced with fatty acid and fatty acyl-CoA production. These had to arrive at the right time at the ATFA to produce the fatty acid ethyl esters. We didn't have all those promoters. And what's more, we wanted a cue to turn on the entire pathway when it got to the right density. So, Fuzong's real work was coming up and engineering all of those promoters that would allow us to regulate this pathway. Um, and so here are some examples of promoters that he built. And they all 
most of them share uh, a very uh, common feature, and that is that they have binding sites for the LAC-I protein and for the FADR protein. The FADR allows us to auto-regulate the pathway, and the LAC-I is that cue we could add an inducer to the culture and turn on the entire cascade that would produce the diesel. And so he built a few variants of those promoters, and the response of one of these promoters to both IPTG and to oleic acid, uh, a fatty acid, is shown here. And you can see that we can induce the promoters um, using either IPTG or oleic acid or both and get uh, a dual response. Now, the question is, which one of those promoters should he put on which part of the pathway? So he did a combination of different promoters with different parts of the pathway. The different promoters are shown here. For ethanol production, the uh, various promoters shown here. For the acyl transferase gene, and right here in the back with this PFL2 on the ethanol production and PFL3 on the ATFA, we get about a fourfold improvement in the production of the fatty acid ethyl esters and a significant increase in the stability of the host so that we could now scale it up into larger scale reactors. Now, those are the alkyl chains. We've done some other work in, these er in this area on other alkyls, um, but I want to go into the branched molecules because these are really important for uh, good cold flow properties in diesels in cold weather climates and in uh, jet fuels. So uh, those can very conveniently be produced using the isoprenoid biosynthetic pathway. Now, I didn't get started on this pathway working on fuels. I actually got started on this pathway producing another hydrocarbon. Uh, in this case, it's an anti-malarial drug. Um, and this is actually a process that's now in production at Sanofi. But what we had done is we had engineered a host that would produce a molecule that's just about the right molecular weight to be a diesel fuel or a jet fuel. It's got a few more branches in it um, and in the wrong places to be a diesel or a jet fuel, but we had a production host that would deliver these molecules to us. And what's more, it didn't just deliver um, one set of molecules, it delivers a whole family of molecules. This can deliver five carbon molecules, 10 carbon molecules, 15 carbon molecules, and even higher. I'm only going to talk about these three today because they're relevant for fuels. Now, uh, with the five carbon molecules, like isopentanol, you get a great gasoline, um, something that has nearly uh, the energy content and the octane number of uh, isooctane. The challenge is producing it because you have to release the pyrophosphate from the precursors, isopentanyl pyrophosphate and dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. So you need a very specific phosphatase. And then once you get um, those uh, alcohols, you need to be able to reduce the double bond. So Howard Chow in my lab found uh, a phosphatase first, and he went through an entire laboratory and found um, one of the best phosphatases. And then he went through an old yellow enzyme family which is a, very, a family of very nonspecific enzymes, to find enzymes that would reduce the double bond. And now we can produce this isopentanol. Now just quickly, um, you can then change the pathway, put in a, a C10 cyclase and get things like limonene and pinene. And these, uh, when they're reduced, turn into pretty good uh, jet fuels. And you can also put in a C15 synthase and get some interesting diesel fuels. And I want to talk just briefly about this molecule and the production pathway for it. Um, this molecule is bisabilane, and it comes from bisabilane. You can produce bisabilane, which is C15, inside the cell um, using a bisabilane synthase. But we first wanted to see if this is going to be worth anything as a diesel. So uh, we bought bisabilane, what we thought was pure bisabilane from Sigma, and it turns out to be pretty dirty. And you send it off and have it tested, and they really can't get you very good cetane numbers on it, which is the measure of how good the diesel is. So once we were able to produce it, we reduced it, we sent it off, and it's got nearly identical properties to number two diesel. It's got a great cetane number, nearly identical to number two diesel. The nice features of it is it has a lower freeze point and a lower cloud point than number two diesel. And this is the diesel that's most commonly used in the US, especially um, where it's cold. And it's got a good density. But we needed to be able to produce it. Now, there are bisabilane synthases that have been cloned from a number of dif different organisms. Um, obvious grandis, or grand fur, um, turns out to be one of the best enzymes, particularly if it's codon optimized for expression in E. coli and yeast, we can get fairly high titers of it. 
And it's, it's a really interesting and complicated enzyme, and I don't have a, a lot of time to go into it, but uh, this is the enzyme. We got a crystal structure for it, and the C15 precursor, the pyrophosphate, goes in this way. It's got two active sites. This one is no longer active. This is the real active site where it's got uh, magnesium molecules that that ex uh, magnesium ions that extract the pyrophosphate from the molecule, it gives you the carbocation, and then that cyclizes in and gives you the bisabiline. Um, and this expresses very well in E. coli. Now, for the last part of my talk, I want to talk about um, the challenges in producing some of these fuels. So ethanol, I told you, is toxic. And uh, it turns out isopentanol is toxic. And this molecule, which the Navy has shown can be dimerized into a great jet fuel, actually is one of the major components and one of the active ingredients in pine salt. So you probably use pine salt. You spray it on your kitchen counter. Why do you spray it there? To disinfect it, right? And turns out that it kills bacteria, pretty much dead. Um, doesn't take a lot of it either. Um, about 30 years ago, Stuart Levy, who's a microbiologist, noticed that if you continue to spray pine salt on your counter, that eventually they acquire resistance and they'll continue to grow. Huh, that's pretty interesting, <laughs> right? We know about uh, multi-drug resistant uh, bacteria. Well, it turns out the way they become resistant is they acquire a pump. And that pump, very selectively, pumps the pinene from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. It diffuses back across the membrane and pumps it back out. And this is a crystal structure of one of these pumps. Very cool uh, uh, molecular motor. So it's got a component that sits on the inner membrane and crosses into the periplasm, a component that's exclusively in the periplasm and attaches to a component that uh, uh, is in the outer membrane. And these work together to pump things from the inside of the cell to the outside, from the inner membrane, from the outer membrane, and from the periplasm outside of the cell. So they're extremely effective. Um, and so we thought, gosh, could we find a pump that would we could engineer cells to make them more resistant to pinene and some of the other fuels that we might want to produce? But which ones would be the right ones? Well, as it turns out, there are more pumps out there than bacteria because every bacterium has several pumps in it, and some bacteria have... 20, 30 pumps in them. So Mary Dunlop, when she was a postdoc at JVA, said, I want to find the best pump for the types of fuels we're going to be producing. And so she first uh, just found all the genes that looked like they encoded pumps, treed them, and then she said, I'm going to sample across this tree um, after they've been sorted by their BLAST score. And I'm just going to pull various ones out from here. I'm either going to clone them from their original organism, or I'm going to have them synthesized. And so that meant that we'd have to express three genes in a plasmid to get a fully functional pump from all the different bacteria that we wanted those pumps from. So we could potentially have thousands of pumps. She chose 40. But then the question is, how are you going to test all those pumps um, to see if they're effective? Well, she decided to let the bacteria do the testing for us and to set up a competition. So she cloned a different pump into each bacterium, transformed them, and so we've got 40 different bacteria with 40 different pumps, right? And she mixed all those bacteria together. And then she added fuel to them. And over several generations of replicate cultures, um, allowed them to enrich. And the whole idea is the bacteria with the best pump would be enriched, and the bacteria with the poorest pumps wouldn't grow at all. And then she made custom arrays, and she pulled out from there um, the pumps that were the winners. And those are shown here. So uh, across the top are some of the fuels, some of our most toxic fuels, geraniol acetate, uh, diesel geraniol, uh, pinene, the, the uh, jet fuel precursor, limonene, and farnesyl hexanoate. And across the uh, y-axis here are all are a variety of different pumps she chose. In blue are where they didn't work, in red is where they worked well, and the other colors are somewhere in between. And what you see is that there are a few pumps that worked quite well for several different fuels. There's one pump that worked for geraniol, um, but she was able to use this technique to find pumps that would make the cells resistant to those fuels. And when you incorporate those pumps uh, with the production of the fuel, you can get increased levels of the fuel, and you can get bacteria that are resistant to it. Now, 
In the last couple of minutes of my talk, I want to talk about addressing this last problem. And if you remember, I told you that one of the most expensive aspects in producing the fuels is the enzyme, the enzyme that breaks down the cellulose and hemicellulose into the component sugars. And this wasn't our idea, but someone a long time ago said, well, gosh, if you could have the organism produce the enzyme as well as the fuel, then uh, that might be the best way to go. They've isolated microbes that have express cellulases and will produce small amounts of ethanol, but certainly not advanced biofuels, and it's almost impossible to engineer these organisms because they're clostridia and others that are very difficult even just to grow. Um, so we thought, well, why not take our biofuel-producing bacteria and engineer them to produce the enzymes that would depolymerize the cellulose and hemicellulose into the sugars that we need to produce the fuel itself? So Greg Bokinski, who's a postdoc at JBay, said, I think I can do this. Um, we need basically two enzymes um, to degrade this toy uh, hemicellulose called Beechwood xylane. You can buy that from Sigma. Uh, you need an endoxylinase to cleave in the middle of the polymer and then a beta xylosidase to release the component sugars, the xylose, from the xylodextrins. This enzyme needs to get outside the cell, so you need a tag on it to export that enzyme. And there's been a lot of work uh, done here. Uh, on that particular uh, tag uh, and other places. Um, and so we took that tag, put it in front of uh, the endoxylinase. Um, the beta xylosidase doesn't have to get out of the cell completely um, because these uh, xylodextrins probably go into the cell. We also needed to time their expression at the right point in the cell cycle. So Greg sorted through and found a series of po uh, promoters that would actually turn on the expression of the genes at the right time. So shown here is the growth of E. coli on xylose in the light blue right here. And here's the growth of E. coli expressing these two genes uh, on beechwood xylan, this toy hemicellulose. And you can see that they grow nearly as well as on xylose. If you leave out either of the enzymes, they don't grow very well at all. Next, Greg said, well, we ought to be able to do the same thing with cellulose. You need basically two enzymes to degrade a Again, toy cellulose called phosphoric acid, swollen cellulose. You can buy it from Sigma. Uh, you need this endocellulase, um, and then you need a beta-glucosidase. Again, the endocellulase needs a tag. Um, the beta-glucosidase uh, doesn't. Um, and you need promoters that will turn those on at the right time. So again, growth of E. coli on uh, glucose, shown here. Not nearly as well, but still grows on cellulose, phosphoric acid, swollen cellulose. If you leave out either of the genes, they don't grow at all. Well, what about real biomass? So uh, we have a process called ionic liquid pretreated pretreatment. It gives a pretty clean uh, cellulose and hemicellulose. So Greg got that uh, pretreated biomass, switchgrass and eucalyptus. These are two possible energy plants. Um, you can grow E. coli on switchgrass, expressing those two enzymes. You can grow it on eucalyptus. If you leave out those enzymes, they don't grow very well at all. This is Greg's backyard. Greg said, well, if I can make it out of those, I ought to be able to make it out of my garden waste. So he brought his garden waste into the lab. We pretreated it with ionic liquids, and indeed, E. coli will grow on his garden waste. But the real question is, can you produce fuels while you're degrading the biomass? And the answer is, yes, we can. Um, so Greg incorporated the fatty acid ethyl ester pathway that I showed you before, and we can produce small amounts. Um, uh, this is in the million dollar a gallon range, but still small amounts uh, of uh, a diesel fuel uh, from switchgrass. You can add in uh, a butanol biosynthetic pathway. I didn't talk about this, and you can get some butanol out of it. You can add in a pinene biosynthetic pathway, and the cells will pr produce pinene from switchgrass. So, um, I've talked today about primarily about getting fuels from this biomass and fuels that mimic the fuels that we now get from petroleum. Well, if you can start to produce fuels that mimic the fuels we get from petroleum, what about all the other chemicals we get from petroleum? Now, I just want to digress a second and have you look around at this space we're in. And in fact, you could look at just about any space. This space isn't in particular. If you look at the, the covering on the floor, the covering on the seats, the plastic on the seats, the paint on the walls, uh, the paint on the lights, uh, and just the fabric on the walls, they're all made out of petroleum. They're all made out of petroleum. This bottle 
that this water is in is made out of petroleum. Now the challenge is that um, we can't deliver to the makers of the bottled water uh, a plastic that doesn't behave exactly like this plastic. This plastic has 40, 50 years worth of research in it. We know how to extrude it. We know how it's going to behave. We know how it's going to ship. We know how it's going to handle in the consumer's hands. So our challenge is to be able to produce molecules that are identical to those we get from petroleum, but now from a renewable resource. So that we can give to the consumer the same products because what's been shown over and over again is except for the people in Berkeley and Seattle, nobody else is going to buy more expensive products that have lower quality. <laughs> and look, we got a few challenges ahead of us. I, I, the list is much longer. I just type, I reduced it so that we could see it here on the screen. But, you know, it's pretty uh, amazing all the stuff we get from petroleum. And I actually think that we can produce a lot of this using synthetic biology, and we will have a great new industry. A lot of people uh, did the work here. I'm only the reporter, um, and I'm thankful for their efforts. I'm also thankful for the generous support from the U.S. Department of Energy and for, to, for you, for your time and attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.